Good morning. We are so happy to welcome you into this worship service today. And as we gather here, we invite our Lord's powerful presence to transform and to touch and reveal to us the gift of His love. I invite you to join me as we pray. Lord, on this day in which we've gathered here as your children to declare your praises and to sing in worship, we invite you to be here. We ask you, Lord, to, to come and to reveal the power of your love in our life in a fresh way. And reveal to us the strength and power of your devotion in our life. If you are our God who is faithful. And as we gather here in the holiness of this moment, Lord, we dedicate our service of worship to you. May all that we experience, may all that we do, may all that we sing, may we encounter you. In the wonderful name of your Son, who is Lord and Savior of our life, that we dedicate our service of worship to you. And it's in your holy name we join together and say, Amen. Amen. Good, morning. good morning. It is good to see everyone here this morning. We welcome you. We welcome you if you happen to be guests here this morning. We're glad that you're worshiping with us. If you're a guest for the first time, we want to make sure that you find out as much as possible about the church and the way that can happen. Uh, if you haven't already stopped out in the narthex, stop there at the desk before you leave this morning. Just give us your name and address. Later this week, someone will stop by your home, not for a visit, but just to say thank you for worshiping with us. They're going to give you a mug, and that mug is going to be filled with information that tells about the many ministries and the many programs that are offered here at this church. So we hope that you will take advantage of that. If the attendance pads have not been passed, please do that now. If someone new has come into the pew or into your row, just pass it one more time. We really do like to have the names of the people that are attending uh, where it helps us to know that you were here. It also helps us to figure out who was not able to be here. That way we can stay in touch with our whole family. So help us with that if you will. If you will open your bulletins to ministry opportunities and events, I've got several things I'd like to talk about. One is that I too want to just praise uh, all the different people in the church that provide music for us throughout the year. Um, this is just such a, a special time and a special opportunity we have to celebrate the way that they help us to praise God. So we are just so pleased with all of our music ministries in the church. Also want to invite folks to, to think about coming to Dessert on the Deck next Sunday afternoon from 2 until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If you've been coming and visiting here for a while, if you would like an opportunity just to sit down and visit with the pastors, next Sunday afternoon would be a good time to do that. It is, we are going to be meeting from 2 until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. At 3 o'clock, there's going to be a band concert here. So those of us, that, th those of you that come and visit uh, we'll just stay for the band concert but we hope that you will come for both of those things thanks um, you've probably heard that today is Norma McLean's 90th birthday we are are so pleased for her we are pleased that her sister Gladys Judy and her husband are have had a really special special time for her I don't know if there's anything still going on in the chapel but you might want to check that out after after you leave here this morning just to be able to say congratulations to her uh, you did receive an insert here about the the different programs that are being offered the educational programs Disciple Bible study is is one of the big programs that's being offered and there is going to be an informational meeting on Sunday September 30th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon here at the church uh, they would love to be able to offer this class in the evening. It is going to take about six people to sign up to take that. So if you just want to find out more about it, take a look at the books, see what's involved in that. Please come on September 30th, uh, look that over, and ask any questions you have about any of the educational opportunities. And don't forget that we do have some other things that are going on. Look on the back of that, and if something has already started, just come on anyway. You can't do that necessarily with the design studies but but our study of Hebrews looks great and we hope that you will join us for that if you didn't get to come last week yet 
The pictorial directory, uh, we have asked people that if you haven't signed up to go to the office, you can go there one more time today after this service and, and sign up if you haven't yet. Uh, we are going to start taking those pictures this Thursday, so now's the time to, to start remembering, I hope you put it on your calendar, when your appointment is. So we will have those appointments coming up the end of this week and the end of next week as well. So be sure to get that on your calendar and get here to the church to have those, uh, those pictures taken. Thank you. This morning, let's join together in our call to worship. It's found in your bulletins and also on our screens this morning. Our awesome God, enable us as redeemed and forgiven children to rejoice in singing your praises. So that as doers of the word and not hearers only, we may receive everlasting life. God is good, all and all the time. God is We're so glad to see you. We are grateful that you've joined us in worship, especially if you're visiting with us today. It's my privilege to welcome you. I want to encourage everyone to make, help us make sure everyone is made to feel welcome in the house of the Lord. Will you greet those around you in our Lord's name?
reading from Daniel 3, verses 4 through 12, one of my very favorite Bible stories from the Old Testament. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the harp, the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Now my reading ends there, and I'm hoping our pastor will give us the rest of the story. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Suzanne. And we are going to have the rest of the story in today. Today is Music Appreciation Sunday, and we are honored by those that share their God-given talent of music with us in many different forms, whether Brock at the organ, our handbell choir, our choir, our youth choir, those persons that accompany us on Wednesday evenings or are those persons that are part of the praise and worship team in the well contemporary service. We are blessed as a church family to have people that are devoted and so willing to guide us and usher us into the holy presence of a God who is holy and who has given us the gift of music as a form of communication with us of his, his love and devotion. Today we want to honor these persons that are in this service that are sharing with us the gift of music. And so I want to ask our, our choir and a handbell choir and Brock, if you'll stand there. And if, maybe if you're not here, but you're, please stand. And if you're a part of the youth choir or any other form of music, if you'll stand, we want to we wanna recognize you. We also want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. So will you share your appreciation first with these persons that are standing? Will you join me as we pray? Lord, we are grateful to you for the gift of music. Music from the sung voice. Music from a skilled hand on an instrument. The gift of music enables our faith to become stronger and deeper. It encourages us at all times. 
it allows us to encounter you in fresh and wonderful ways. We thank you, Father, that you are the author of music and it has been given to us as a wonderful and amazing and holy gift. And for these persons that are before you, we give you thanks for them. And ask you, Lord, to continually bless them and their talents. Thank you for their gift of time and devotion. And we ask you, Lord, to pour out into their lives times of blessing as they seek to usher us into your presence with their ministry. Lord, we thank you for them. But most of all, Lord, we give you honor and praise for the gift of music and for the way it ministers to us in our hearts and in our lives. And it's in your holy name we pray. And together we say, Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward now for a time of tithes and our offerings. I often contemplate what has God given me? What have I not recognized in my life that is a, truly a gift from God? At this time in our service, we lift up those things that God has given us and we are thankful for them and we give back in joy to our church, our community, and to the world through our Methodist church. If you would like to give, we would love for you to give. But do so in joy, knowing that God has given you so much in your life, many things that we never recognize. If you have a dollar in your pocket, we are often ask that you give that dollar in remembrance that many people in the world live on so little.
gracious and giving God. Thank you for these gifts that have been given. Bless them, keep them, multiply them for your kingdom, for your people, and for the glory of your creation. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. you to be seated. As you take your seats, if you would, please make note of the insert in your bulletin. It has our celebrations, our cares, and our concerns on it. We have some additions this morning. We want to make note that Ralph and Connie Clark have made a donation to the music department in celebration of their 56th wedding anniversary, which was yesterday on September 15th, so we are prayerfully thankful with them. We also want to celebrate this morning that it is Norma McLean's 90th birthday. I believe they had a reception for her just a little while ago, but we will celebrate with her this morning. We have some additions and changes. I want to make note that in the hospital we do have Max Fishbach and Larry Timmons. Please uh, keep both of them in your prayers, but particularly we ask for prayers for Max and his family as Max has lost a, a leg due to his diabetes and other things. So please remember Max, particularly in your prayers this week as he struggles with uh, things that he has never had to deal with before and we've worried about this for some time so keep Max in your prayers. I want to keep uh, Bill Platt in our prayers. He is the brother-in-law of, uh, did this one earlier incorrectly, Nita McCain but uh, keep Bill in your prayers as he's been in the hospital this week. Uh, Erling Green is not listed in our uh, bulletin here this morning but she is convalescing at home. She was in the hospital last week so we have quite an extensive list here. We also have our list of prayer concerns that you can receive at the end of the service. Please take one of those and, and pray for all those that we're praying for here at the church. We appreciate your prayers for them. If you have a prayer concern, please fill out one of our prayer cards. You can leave it in the prayer box in the narthex or give it to one of our ushers or Brother Jamie or I or Jan, one of our pastors. We would love to pray with you and for you. We also want to make note that uh, Dave Weber, he attends typically, he and his wife Annie attend our second service, our contemporary service, but Dave fell this past week, and uh, we ask your prayers for him also. The family of faith that we're praying for this week is Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. As you drive through Bella Vista or travel around, remember to pray for all of our communities of faith here in and around us, and uh, pray for all the Christians across the world who celebrate the same God that we do, who worship this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. If we would now, let us prepare for our prayer and song.
pray this morning. Gracious God, we have gathered here this morning to worship. To worship in song, to worship in music, in the playing of instruments. Lord, we are thankful for the voices that many of us have been given. We are thankful for the musical talents of those around us and for the ones that you have given each of us. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of just being encouraged to make a joyful noise in whatever manner we can. We are thankful that you have given us the freedom to do so. That you have encouraged us as your children to express ourselves in love and in joy of all that we have been given. And today we do so. Lord, we pray for all those around our world who do so with us for the churches and communities of faith here in Bella Vista, and for those on the other side of the earth. We are thankful that we are together knowing that you are our God, that you are a living God, eternally with us and forever faithful. Lord, we are thankful for your healing and comforting touch in the lives of all those who are ill. We pray for Lord... We pray, Lord, for all those that we know. We lift up our friends, our families, and ourselves. We lift up, particularly, Lord, those who have no one with them. We ask that you open our eyes and show us all those around us in need who need a friend and who need to know that you are a God who is with them also. Lord, we ask that you would help us to give those around us hope, hope in you, our Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask for your blessings on our world, a world that is in turmoil, where fires rage in battles across the globe. We ask for peace and understanding. Lead us where we need to go to be a people that understand that evil is not your way that you would have us come to no harm, that you would save us from all that we do and from all those decisions that we make, if you could, that you are there with us, leading us to your paths and not the paths of destruction that we choose. Lord, keep us and guide us as your church. Hold us as your people and bless them. Bless us as in your kingdom. All these things we pray as your precious Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Today we continue our sermon series, God's Story, Our Story. God's story is the story of loving people, and our story is the story of loving God. In the last um, couple of weeks, since we began our sermon series on Labor Day weekend, on the first Sunday of September, we've been, we've been working through God's story of loving us and the ways that He loves us. On the front of your bulletins is a picture, and we've, we're talking about those forms of God's love in relationship. Devotion, presence, strength, and faithfulness. Today we're talking about devotion. Two weeks ago when we began our sermon series, we began by hearing a person's story. His name is Bobby Roberts. Bobby is a 42-year-old gentleman who works in Rogers. But for 35 years of his life, um, Bobby struggled with wrong decisions and addiction habits. That encringed and, and stole a lot of life from Bobby. But within the last seven years, Bobby has come to know 
God's amazing, transforming love and God's devotion for Bobby. Bobby's story. It's a story of loving God. And then last Sunday, we looked at Psalm 121 when we talked about relationship, that our God is a God of relationship. And in a relationship with God, He reveals to us His help. We began Psalm 21 remembering the very words of the first verse. I lift my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And today we are reading Suzanne Shoemaker's favorite Bible story in chapter 3, Daniel chapter 3. And we're going to talk about the rest of the chapter. She shared with us the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and King Nebuchadnezzar that he had built a statue of gold in order that the Chaldeans and all the Babylonians and that persons in the nation would bow down and worship the king when they heard the sound of music. But as Suzanne told us, there were astrologers who were informants to Nebuchadnezzar and they told him there are three that will not bow now. So Nebuchadnezzar had a conversation with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you and I are going to enter in in Scripture to a part of that conversation beginning with verse 19 and we'll read the verse 28. And then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times and hotter than usual. And commanded some hotter and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The, com- the king ca- commands was so urgent that the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men who we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, Certainly, O king. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace. And he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the straps and the perfects, governors and the royal advisors crowded around them. And they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was the hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. And verse 28 tells us, Then King Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Three children from the land of Israel, Shadrach, Meshach, and took a trip to the land of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and took a lot of gold and made an idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and the gold. And he told everybody we'd hear the music of the trumpet. He told everybody we'd hear the music of the flute. And he told everybody we'd hear the music of the horn. They must fall down and worship the idol shed right the shack of Bendigo. But the children of Israel would not bow down shed right the shack of Bendigo. So the king 
what the children in the fiery furnace Steep down cold, it's a great hot brimstone Save times hotter, hotter than it ought to be Shad, rack, me jangling it Well, you couldn't burn a hair On the head of Saturday Laverty talking while the fire jumping round <laughs> There's a call, hey there, hey there. And he saw the power of law And they had a big time in the house of Babylon Shut the right, we shack a bed nigga Oh, 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 a bed nigga Nobody can tell it uh, Louis Armstrong, right? Whether you want to admit it or, or not All of us have been influenced in some way By some type of music At some point in time in our life Whether it was gospel or Christian hymns of the church, whether it was classical or country and western, whether it was rock and roll or, or blues or jazz or, or the boogie-woogie sounds of the, the big band era, all of us have been influenced. Music has, has made its mark on us. Some type of musical style has influenced our life. It's been said that God gave us the, the gift of music so that we could hear the melodies of our heart. Music can be used to uplift our souls. It can be used to elevate the mind. It can be used to calm our fears. It can be used to relax our bodies. It can be used to promote peace. It can be used to kindle love. It can be used to usher us in the presence of God in worship. Music causes us to react. I do a lot of weddings. And I've yet to hear... Or experience a time at a wedding when the wedding march was played that the congregation did not stand in honor of the bride's entrance and look in adoration at the bride. You and I know what to do when we hear our national anthem played. That we are to stand in honor. Our right hand over our hearts. If we have a cap, gentlemen, we are to remove it. And we are to sing. Of our nation's glory. When you hear the fight song of your alma mater. There is something that automatically. Wells up within you as a form of excitement. Music has a way. Of causing us to react. But music when used in a wrong way. Can corrupt. It can entice us to do wrong. And it can cause us to make bad decisions. And that is the way that Nebuchadnezzar was using music. He used music as a signal to persons to, to bow down and worship a graven idol of gold that he, had caught, that he had ordered to be created. Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon. He was a powerful king. He was a ruthless, he was a cruel king. You didn't cross Nebuchadnezzar because there was always harm that fo followed you when you did. He led Babylon to defeat many nations. He was a force that was not to be reckoned with and he was a man who was not devoted to God. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had found favor with Nebuchadnezzar up until the point that he discovered that they would not bow in honor of his decree. So the music would sound. And the people did what they were told. They would react by bowing to this golden idol. But not Shadrach. He didn't move. And not Meshach. He didn't bow. And not Abednego. And the reason they did not it's because they were devoted to God. And they knew the Levitical law. And you and I can read that in Leviticus in the 26th chapter in verse 1. Where it is written that you um, are not to make any idols or graven images. And you are not to bow down to them. The story of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego is truly a story of, of devotion. It's a story of, of devotion to God. And in the verses that Suzanne didn't read and that I have not read to you yet, 
is the story of the song that these three men sang. There's a song, they're a song of devotion to God. And they sang these to Nebuchadnezzar. And in those verses, we read these words as they were faced with the king. They said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But, they said in verse 18, but even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. And you know what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they received a prize for this devotion to God. And that prize that they were received was the punishment of being thrown into a fiery furnace that was heated seven times hotter than normal, so hot that it took the lives of the soldiers that bound them and threw them in. But what we see, ultimately, in their story, is the story of our God, who works for us in people's lives, in the midst of the heat of life, in the midst of the times of adversary in life, in the midst of the pressures of life. Because our God is a God who doesn't forget us. And our God is a God who does not neglect His own. Because God's story is a story of loving people. The story of your life reveals that. It's a story of God loving people and it's a story of devotion. So when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, are in the fire, you know what? They're not alone. Nebuchadnezzar, he's watching, he's witnessing, he's excited that the three men are to be exterminated. And as he is watching, waiting for their demise... He notices that their, their bodies are not harmed, that the hair on their head is not singed, that their clothes are not burning up. But beyond that, he noticed that, this, that they're unbound. And not only are they unbound, that there is the fourth presence in that fire. And he said, he identified it as the son of the gods. The fourth person in the fire. And it is in that awakening moment that Nebuchadnezzar is a changed man. He's changed from a, a self-serving, hate-filled bully into a person who is willing to submit his own life to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know as well as I do, life is full of furnaces, isn't it? It's full of furnaces that, that compete for our devotion. It's full of furnaces that want to sway our loyalty. It's full of furnaces that, that try to weaken our faith in God. But when the furnace of adversary and adversity become blazing, and the heat is on in life, you know what? That is our signal to react just like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. That's our signal to remain faithful to our God who is able. It's our signal to even be more devoted to God who gives us strength in life and who allows us, gives us the ability to endure. You've been sharing with me in this sermon series your stories. In this past week, I was honored to have two different persons in our church family share with me their stories of God's devotion in their life. These are stories of, of devotion when they found themselves facing the fire of adversity. And I want to share these two stories with you. The first is, is the story that Liz and Ewart Scarf shared with me. It's a story that took place this very week in their lives. Some of you may know, um, you and Liz, they worship at the 8 o'clock service. And Liz, over the last couple of years, has been battling um, health concerns related to 
multiple myeloma. Liz, she's, she's been through a lot. She's experienced a lot. Her emotions have been on mountaintops and, and they've been in the valleys. But throughout it all, she's been so blessed to have the support of, of, of her husband, Ewart, as they face the furnace of adversity related to, to Liz's health concerns. Liz and Ewart, they have a devoted a devoted faith to God. I, truly they do. Every day. They begin their day. In Bible study. When they wake up. And, and they pour that first cup of coffee. They spend time together. In God's word. And with God. And that's their normal practice. They found themselves even drawn closer to God. In this, this fire that they've been experiencing of hell. And they're faithful in prayer. And oftentimes they, they retreat to Mildred Cooper Chapel to spend time there in prayer. Recently, I, as I finished a, a wedding, I found them in the parking lot waiting for, for the wedding guests to leave the Cooper Chapel so that they could go and, and be there in prayer. Well, on Wednesday, Yurt stopped by the church and he was excited to, to share this story of, of God's loving encouragement for he and, and Liz in a, in a time in which... Liz had become discouraged. And she had become very weary in the fire of the battle of her health. It took place just at the first of the week. They had gone outside on the deck on that beautiful morning to, to have their coffee and to be in their time of Bible study together. And in that time, Liz became very honest with you and she became honest with herself and she became honest with God. And she told you, she was just tired of all of this. She was so discouraged that things did not seem to, to be getting better, but she was so tired of the fight. And they shared in, that, in that, that time together, they shared in that time together with God. About 8.15, Coffee cups were empty, and Ewart said, I'll go in and I'll fill our coffee cups. And he did. When he went in, he picked up his phone, and he noticed that he'd received a text message. Ewart doesn't use his phone for text messages. He doesn't send texts, and, and it has not been his custom to receive texts. But on that day, he knows that he had received a text number from a, a text from a number he did not recognize. And he picked up his phone. And he looked at the text. It did not identify a person's name. But what it did identify was God's word. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35. And it said these words. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God. You will receive what he has promised. Ewart was amazed that in the, the midst of the fire that God had revealed that he was present with them as a fourth person in the fire. And he hurried back outside with his phone to share that verse with Liz. And together they rejoiced in the midst of that furnace that they were experiencing God's revealed story of his devotion for them when they needed it. Well, you know... Liart told me that story and I opened up the Bible and I read over that and then I read verse 39 that says this. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. For that's who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. They didn't shrink when they faced the threat and the follow through of the king. And Liz in that moment, she did not shrink because she knew that God was with her. Now what is interesting to know is that after the first service, somebody in the first service came up to you and said, I'm the one that sent you that text. I just felt God prompted me to send it. 
And I did. And that was Owen Jones who sent that to Ewart. And God used him as a conduit of his love and devotion at a point in time in which Ewart and Liz needed to know the power of God's love. Second story I want to share with you. It's the story of Glenn Hogue. Some of you may know this story. Glenn and Martha also worship at the first service. Story took place about five years ago when Glenn was 82 years old. It was a cold and windy January day. Glenn is an experienced fisherman and he had decided to go fishing on that day. It was 24 degrees outside. He was, he was bundled up so that he could jump in a boat and the wind would not affect him. But he went to the end of the lake where he normally launched his boat to fish and realized it was really too rough and choppy for him to, to fish that day. And he th so he thought he'd try the other end of the lake. And it was much more calm, so he decided to go fishing. As he was maneuvering out into the lake, he looked and noticed that there was a pontoon boat that had come untied from one of its moorings. And Glenn's a good Samaritan, so he, he thought he would just go over and he would retie the boat and then go on his way and continue on, on a day that was, had, he thought would be as normal as always. He hopped out of his own boat onto the deck and he took a long pole. Had a hook on this long pole and he reached to to grab the pontoon to pull it closer to him so he could retie it. And that's when things changed. What Glenn never imagined would happen, happened. The pole broke. And when the pole broke, Glenn fell backward into the lake. He was bound and bundled in these heavy winter clothes that soon filled up with water and became a weight like an anchor that was drawing him down. He was unable to, to climb onto the deck and he couldn't reach his boat. He was about 40 feet away from the shore. And frantically, he decided he'd have to try his best to swim to shore. He was cold, he was wet, he was fighting, he was frantic. And he was swimming and pedaling desperately. And somewhere along the way, he lost consciousness. And over three hours later, a lake ranger came by the dock. He had a load of brush that he was going to throw into the lake to attract the fish. And he happened to look over onto a cement walk. And there he noticed the figure of a man's body. And he quickly went over and he found this body with face lying down and he rolled the, the body over and there he recognized it as, as Glenn Hogue. He was scared to death at that moment because he thought Glenn was dead. He couldn't find a pulse. And he could not tell that he was breathing. But he thought he saw Glenn move his leg and so frantically he called 911 and the emergency medical teams and the police department. They arrived. The EMTs first found no pulse. And they took Glenn's body temperature and it was 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And they kept working with Glenn and finally EMT said, I think I found a pulse. And another one said, you know what? I think I saw his leg move just like the ranger. And they stripped Glenn's clothes off of him gently because they were frozen to his body. And they began to to warm his body up with, by pumping warm water into his stomach and wrapping him in blankets. And then they, they whisked him off to the hospital that was about 10 miles away. And there in the hospital emergency room, two doctors met Glenn and they quickly checked him. And at that moment in time, they pronounced that he had died. His body had warmed up to 72 degrees. There was an EMT nurse that was there and she said to the doctors, Doctors, I'm getting a pulse. And they continued CPR. And at the same time that all this is taking place, a policeman has arrived at Glenn and Martha's home to inform Martha of the accident. 
Ms. Will not tell her specifically what has happened, but that she just needs to get to the hospital. Is there a neighbor that is able to take her? And so there is a neighbor that is able to take her. When she arrives at the hospital, she's met by the hospital chaplain and a doctor, and she is taken into a small room where it is explained to her that Glenn has drowned and that they're trying to revive him. And the doctor tells her that few people survive such an accident, especially someone whose age is against them like Glenn. And they, they are honest with Martha. They, they tell her that if they manage to revive him, statistics show that he will only live a few hours, but if he lives more than that, he will have permanent brain damage. And so their suggestion to Martha at that moment in time was that they end all heroic means of survival. But Martha didn't hear that. She said, absolutely no. I've not even seen him yet. And she went to see Glenn. And she called her sons. And she asked their advice. And they said, no, we're, we're on our way. When she went in to see him in ICU or an emergency room, what she found was a man who was unconscious. Still very cold. And there were tubes and there were IVs. They were all over him. Glenn was then moved to critical condition and he was unaware for, for a long time that anything was happening. But later in that day, gradually, he began to regain his consciousness and he, he tried to talk, but he couldn't because of the tubes that were in his mouth. They wanted him to remain quiet and sedated. And all Martha could do was sit there and hold Glenn's hand and pray. Well, hours later, hours that seemed like days, eventually, Glenn awakened. He was not able to talk, but he was able to write, and he scribbled on a piece of paper, what happened? Then he put the word sick with a question mark, and he wrote out the word heart attack with a question mark. And they helped him to understand what had happened. It was determined that bacterial pneumonia had set in, in Glenn's body and that in the, the stress of it all he had had a heart attack and that a bacterial infection had entered the GI tract from the dirty water and it was a fiery furnace time for Glenn and Martha but now I want to end this long story and tell you a week later they removed the tubes from his throat and they moved, removed other things that were attached to him and when he was able to talk Glenn's first words were when do we eat? And he didn't remember anything. He didn't remember anything past falling into the water. He had no idea of how he survived or how he swam or, or how he crawled the 30 to, to 40 feet through the gravel up to the cement sidewalk where he was found by the park ranger. But what Martha and Glenn did, did know then and what they do know now was that God was the fourth person in the fire. And these are their words that they write. But we still believe God had, God had a hand in all of this. We are convinced that God does watch over us. And that he takes care of us. Liz and Ewart. Martha and Glenn. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They, they all discovered that life at times can be like a furnace. And in those times it requires that we sing a song of, of devotion to, to God. And the thing that gives value to each of these persons' deliverance from, from their fiery furnace was not the deliverance itself, but it is their unconditional commitment and devotion to God. I mean, God's love for us in the fires of life gives validity to His devotion to us. And our devotion to God is not... not Proven by prevention. But in the experience. I mean our 
devotion to God is not to be conditional, but it's to be unconditional because our God is a God who is unconditional in His love for us. And our God is able, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to Nebuchadnezzar, our God is able to deliver us. To deliver us. He is able. And if there's any fear, or any disappointment, or any hurt, or any sin, or anything that keeps us from knowing and experiencing and being devoted to God with total trust and reliance, then you know what? God wants us to be honest enough to give that to Him. That fear. That disappointment that hurt, that pain. Because God is a God who sings over you. And the song that He sings is a song of devotion. Lord, we thank You that at all times in our life You are our God who is devoted. And You are our God who is faithful. And we know that fiery trials of life, are, where none of us are immune from them, we all experience them. And Lord, we pray that we will remain devoted to you because you are our God who is devoted to us. May we see the example of Liz and Ewart and Glenn and Martha and these three who would not bow and know that you met them at their point of their need because you are a God who is able and continually you will meet us at the point of our need and make us able. It's in the knowledge of your Son, our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, who has come as our Redeemer, Savior, that we offer our hearts to you in prayer. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning, our closing hymn is hymn number 140. Great is thy faithfulness. As we share in the singing of our last song together this morning, I offer to you this invitation, and that is if you'd like to become part of our church family, we'd love to receive you here on transfer of your membership from another church family. Or on profession of faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord of your life. If you'd like to be prayed with, we, Pastor Lee or myself, we're here to pray with you. If you just want to spend your own personal time in prayer, the altar is here for you. I invite you to stand and sing a song of devotion to God, declaring that our God is a God who's faithful. Will you please stand and come as you feel led?